we see it. Yes, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a kind invitation and I highly appreciate the uh, funding support that we've received from, uh, from HALO so far. far. Uh, I'm highly excited also to present our work here. And uh, you will see the, the title is maybe a bit strange, making the most of structural biology. I could have also called it differently. Let me just see how to continue here, namely venture into the unknown, because this is about a lot of different techniques where it's not my primary expertise. And how we got into this was that there was a call by the Norwegian Research Council in 2017 about neutron based technologies. So we found this very exciting, but there was another call just at the same time. And so I asked my uh, postdoc, Cole uh, Bjergård Andersen, to help me prepare these two proposals. So without him, probably I would not be speaking about this now. And he did a great job on, the, on that proposal. And even better, we uh, recruited uh, an excellent PhD student. Henrik Winter Sørensen, who is also in the audience today. So mainly what I'm talking about is his PhD project. It's actually the first time I present this project. He has done plenty of his presentations here and he will be available in the discussion as well. There are, since this is not my primary expertise, there needed to be a lot of collaborators here. So apart from core, it's another co-supervisor is Raida Lund, who is an expert in scattering techniques. And then Esko Oksanen, he has been the co-supervisor on the HALOS project. And I would also like to explicitly mention Gustav Valle Koistad, who is our uh, collaborator from OS and MBU on the LPMO project. And you can see there are a lot of people from uh, different, um, for example, different uh, neutron sources and also locally who have been involved. Originally, I have become interested in the molecular mechanisms of cholera, but so far I have uh, mainly been focusing here on the right side of the picture, namely the mechanisms of the major virulence factor, the cholera toxin. So how it enters the cell, and I'm interested in the whole process until finally the ions are secreted and with it follow a lot of water, and then you get the typical uh, symptoms of severe diarrhea. And then in the last few years, we also uh, uh, switched our focus to the colonization factor, namely GBPA or N-acetylglucosamine binding protein A, which both is important for colonizing uh, surfaces in the aquatic environment, for example, zooplankton, and also the mucins in the human host. So this is the target of the current presentation. Already in 2012, there was a crystal structure, I was not involved in that by uh, Dan van Alten's lab, uh, about the first three structures of this modular protein. So you see it has, uh, there is a, um, a secretion a signal. Then you have an LPMO domain, that's the, the catalytic domain, which degrades, uh, chitin in this case, so uh, um, polysaccharides in general. Then there are two domains which are likely involved for attaching to the bacteria. And then there's another carbohydrate binding domain. So both the LPMO domain and the, uh, the fourth doma domain bind chitin and uh, mucin binding is only via the LPMO domain. So this is the crystal structure here to 1.8 angstrom resolution of the first three domains. And there has been a SACS envelope for the full four, four domain structure. So this is how we think it works. So we have the bacteria in water that secrete the GBPA protein, and then it uh, helps to colonize chitinous surfaces, mainly zooplankton, but also crustaceans like this shrimp here. And here you see uh, the structure of chitin. And then via an unknown uh, binding partner or receptor on the bacteria, it docks to somewhere, I, it's not three and four, but somewhere on the GBPA, that's the bacterium gets docked there. 
And GBP ASA has a lot of homologs and other pathogens, which can be uh, either human or fish pathogens. And there have been even some GBPA homologs uh, found in viruses. So that has an important role probably in a number of pathogenic species. If we look at the HALOS project in context, then this is from our original proposal, uh, the neutron-based toolbox of structural biology, neutron crystallography, neutron reflectometry, and small angle neutron scattering. And for all of these three uh, techniques, it's very good to have deuterated protein. And uh, we are also interested in some other techniques. I mean, essentially we want to, to solve the questions and answer the questions, uh, no matter what technique we use. It can be also X-ray related techniques like X-ray crystallography and SUCS, NMR spectroscopy or cryo-ET. Cryo-EM, so single particle cryo-EM, is maybe less relevant because this is a 51 kilodalton protein, so it's really at the limits of what can be done. But what, what we could potentially do, but we, we haven't come there yet, is to look at the whole chitin fibers and see if we can identify the GBPA molecule on those. But in all uh, cases for the uh, neutron-based methods, the first step is deuteration. And so that means we need to replace the normal hydrogen with deuterium. And hydrogen has three isotopes, as you will probably remember. So the, the normal one is called protium, where you just have a protium, uh, the, the proton in the nucleus and an electron. Uh, deuterium has, uh, uh, in addition, uh, one, uh, now I'm forgetting the name, <laughs> what, uh, so, and tritium has two, to uh, additional heavier particles so that you have either a mass of one, two, or three Dalton here. And if you would drink uh, deuterated water, then this is not particularly good. So if we want to de deuterate the protein, then we have to adapt it slowly and also use minimal medium. And in this particular case, we were extremely lucky. Usually that's a, it's a problem step, but in, in this case, we were able to get even higher uh, amounts of protein than before. So this is the, the process that Henrik has worked out. So first uh, using rich medium, LV medium with water to slowly then adapt it to transfer to, to rich medium with D2O and then increase the sizes uh, to, to higher volumes and uh, putting in minimum media with uh, deuterated glycerol and at a certain time then induction with IPTG. And this has uh, needed a lot of refinement and I have seen a very tired Henrik in those days because uh, it has taken a long time with induction and so he stayed around the clock in the, in the lab at this time. Afterwards, the protein was uh, purified. So first it, it secreted, so periplasmic lysis was uh, important. And then we have uh, anion exchange, chromatography and, and SEC. And here you see the results. So we got very nice protein and uh, the deuterated one is a bit less pure, but also quite good. So absolutely usable. Uh, and here the SEC peak, so these come nicely at the same point. Uh, we got quite good deuteration, 86% deuteration as determined by mass spectrometry, and then a yield of 12 milligram per liter medium. So conclusion, the, uh, the glycerol, deuterated glycerol can replace deuterated glucose. That was the original protocol we started out with saving us money and we can get significant amounts of uh, deuterated protein. So this, this was a very good start. Also the structure looks quite similar as compared with SUCS. Uh, looking at the, the envelopes here of the hydrogenated and deuterated material and uh, the protein is active. So you can see here for the hydrogenated and deuterated material, we get the small uh, kite, chitin fragments that we would expect to get. 
the next step was to try to get uh, deuterated domain one so that we can actually do neutron crystallography on that. And there we had less luck. So it was lower yields when producing an E. coli unless using a fermenter. And here I would like to credit D-Lab and at ILL. And I'm very ha happy that Trevor is here today who was heavily involved in this work. So we mainly use the deuterated material from um, D-Lab here and because we got low yields ourselves. And this then enabled uh, crystallography studies. So we needed to crystallize domain one and uh, we did and actually got quite a few different uh, hits and some of them might look more promising than others. If you look at these ones here look much nicer than the crystals on the on the left hand side, but uh, looks can be deceiving for people like for crystals. And actually it's the inner qualities that are important and they all diffracted to between 1.1 and 1.3 angstrom resolution. What I learned from, from ESCO uh, during the HALOS project is that it's actually important that we use a high symmetry space group because one of the main problems when you do neutron crystallography is that you have a, a low completeness and so having P1 is not a very good idea. And then it would be nice to use those crystals are the best reproducible. So actually these poorly looking crystals were the ones that we uh, decided to, to go on further. And they actually only appeared with a deuterated material. I, I'm not exactly sure why that is the case. So we increased the crystal size that is necessary because uh, the, the neutron beam doesn't interact so uh, strongly with the uh, crystals than uh, the X-ray beam does. And this was done by seeding and feeding into larger drops. But the major bottleneck is really the amount of deuterated domain one. We also tried to dissolve some crystals again. It's possible, but it's amazingly stable, these crystals, when you put them in water that they don't easily dissolve, not like many other proteins. We did solve an X-ray structure of that to 1.2 angstrom resolution with decent R factors and having the copper ion in the uh, active site surrounded by the two histidines of the histidine brace motif, which is typical for LPMOs. And compared to the earlier crystal structure that was solved to 1.8 angstrom resolution, it looks very similar. Uh, not so much in the active site though, but this is because the crystal structure didn't have this important copper factor and we did, but generally so very good superimposition. Unfortunately, the crystals are still not big enough for a neutron crystal structure, but uh, we are lucky that we have recruited a new PhD student, Matteo on the project. So we hope that this will still be able to achieve at some point. But we, in the meantime, we were able to solve the X-ray crystal structure of a homologue of GBPA, namely CBPD from Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the hydrogenated one, um, to 0.75 angstrom resolution. And this is the highest resolution data set that has been collected at Biomax at Max4. And we are about to write a publication on that. So this will hopefully soon be known to a broader audience. And you can see that there's really nice resolution here. And we can start to see hydrogens. This is, uh, there's no carbohydrate in there, but this is just a superposition to show where the carbohydrate, the chitin is about to bind. And uh, unfortunately, there is no copper. This was actually a lucky case because just before sorting out some crystal craze uh, from NMBU, this, this huge crystal was discovered and there was no copper, but it will be a very good starting point also for MD simulations further on this. Now we get to the chitin binding. So we expect that there's likely a a change in conformation from the unbound to the bound GBPA molecule because both the domain one and domain four have to bind. 
and in the uh, in the um, solution structure it's more looking like the wave so they are on opposite sides so here we now have to turn to neutron reflectometry or a small angle neutron scattering from our toolbox the neutron reflectometry works like this so you have a neutron beam it's which is reflected on the sample and then detected on a detector essentially think of if you have a car on a parking lot and then you throw balls at it and you try to uh, get the structure from the reflection but there's of course not just one car but there are many cars and they might not be parked in order but in in ma many different orientations so what we can get is uh, how how high the car is so this is a really low resolution information and you can Im imagine that it's very important that this parking lot where it's standing is even and that it's not like hilly terrain because then you would not even get the information of the height so it's very important to get this smooth car uh, parking lot and that means for our case we need to have a smooth chitin surface this can be done either by spin coating. That's quite easy to imagine, I think. I mean, if you have the, the chitin in, well, maybe not solution, but in suspension, you can, by spinning, you can distribute it uh, more or less evenly on a surface, or which it didn't work that well for, for us or Henrik, I should say. So he went to Langmuir blotted deposition where you have the chitin essentially on the surface of water and then you press with a mobile barrier. And uh, when all the chitin fibers have lined up, you drag out a silicon wafer and on that you line up the chitin. And there we had, uh, so I mentioned here Interreg because that was an Interreg uh, project where Catherine Browning in particular, but also Mariti Cardenas were involved. So this was the chitin surfaces we managed to get. So you can see here is the chitin compared to the uh, AFM without chitin here, which is relatively smooth, but still not smooth enough for a neutron reflectometry. It, it would work for, for other techniques, for example, SBR or so if we want to use it there. But we have higher hopes than for the small angle neutron scattering. And that's, we, we didn't pursue here because we thought, how do we use our time most effectively? And then we went to new, uh, small angle neutron scattering where we can expect to get a bit better resolution also. So as he Henrik likes to compare, this is like uh, um, really trying to, to battle with something that you don't see or as he put it, the magic of contrast matching, which is not so nice for Batman maybe here, but we want to see Batman. Stop talking here. Good. Yes, so if we want to see Batman in the crowd, then this is the perfect technique for us. Comparing X-ray and neutron scattering, uh, for the X-ray scattering, the X-rays are scattered at the electrons. So that means that you, you get uh, an, uh, a linear increase in scattering for uh, increased numbers in the periodic table. The more electrons, the, the more intense the scattering. But for neutrons, that's not uh, equally the case. So there it's quite complicated. But the nice thing is that if you look at hydrogen, which has very poor intensity for the X-ray scattering, that actually has quite a significant value here for the neutron scattering. And here I should make you aware in case you don't know it, that the value is the most important. It doesn't matter if it's negative or positive scattering, that's just due to a phase change. And even better scattering uh, has deuterium, but here it's positive scattering. And that's what we are making use of. So if we look at uh, two partners in a system and uh, in water, then we might see some of them uh, a bit stronger than others. If we um, have a, a ratio of 
a D2O to H2O, which just matches out one of the component, we either see that component or the other component. So by adjusting this ratio, we might be able to see just one of these molecules. And in our particular case, we are, of course, interested in seeing GBPA and not interested in seeing chitin. So we want to find out the right match ratio for, for matching out the chitin, and that was found to be 47%. This work was done at, at ILL, so Henrik went there and got good help from Sylvain Perellos here. And then we went to NIST to do the uh, further science experiments. But first, we needed to, to prepare the samples. And that, that is also not, not as trivial as it might seem. For one, chitin is, is, is not a soluble substance. So that already had to be put in suspension. And that can be done with, uh, with uh, sonication. So very intense sonication. And we used better chitin fibers from squid for that. And that requires a low pH. Now at this low pH, GBPA is not very happy. It denatures, so that's more happy at seven or eight, uh, pH of seven or eight, uh, at which point uh, chitin will fall out, out of solution. So this really required Henrik's skills. So he managed to, to for some time to have GBPA soluble at pH five, that was roughly what could be done and just added in small amounts to chitin. And immediately he saw that the solution or the, the, the suspension become a lot, became a lot less viscous, much easier to pipe it. And by vigorous pipetting up and down, then uh, he, he had a good suspension and he could even uh, adjust the pH to higher pHs after that. So this showed us in principle that the GBPA binds rapidly to, to chitin and there is a change in the properties. So now to the SANS experiments. I haven't shown you that it's, it's in principle similar to SUCS here. So you have the intensity here on the one side and then Q on the X uh, axis. And uh, if you don't know what Q means, at least you see here it's the inverse of angstrom, so it has something to do with the in inverse of, of uh, distances. So if you go to low Q, this means large, like micrometer scale distances, if you go to U suns, or here you go to smaller and smaller distances. <clears throat> uh, when we see what we get, we see a lot of these bars, these uh, vertical bars, and they show huge error ranges, and that is due to the matching out. So if we have 47% D2O, we ha hardly have, uh, we hardly see any high hydrogenated GBPA. And we also don't see much of the chitin, except for here at the low Q values where you see it goes up with intensity showing that there is um, aggregation. And from the slope of the aggregates, you the aggregation from the slope of this curve, you can see uh, the di dimensionality if it's linear or two-dimensional or three-dimensional aggregates. But for the deuterated GBPA, we see small errors here in this area, uh, medium uh, area, so this bump here. And this, from that you could, we didn't do it here for this experiments, but you could show the, the envelope of GBPA. And then we wanted to add chitin, of course, and that is this red curve. And you see that that's quite similar to the chitin curve alone, and certainly doesn't have this bump here. And if you add uh, the scattering of um, both the DGPPA and the chitin, you see it's quite different. So something dramatically happens. And what we first thought that the, the the GBPA is really stretching out, uh, not like this, this little horseshoes, but really stretching out on the chitin. But we cannot really say that. We can really say only that it's strong structural co correlation. And we wanted to reduce this structural correlation by uh, a trick 
which uh, Henry came up with, namely that you have different ratios of, of uh, deuterated uh, and hydrogenated GBPA. And if you just have the right ratio, maybe we can isolate one of these molecules here and actually get the envelope of GBPA as it is on chitin. But we didn't turn out to be quite as lucky here because if we went too far down with the amount of deuterated GBPA, then we just got a, a very low intensity here. So either we got very low intensity or we still had a strong structural correlation. So that was not the way to go. But we can give some main conclusions from this work. The one from the suspension experiments already that you have very rapid binding of GBPA to chitin. And there's obviously a preference for the chitin bound state um, to the solution. So it doesn't just uh, go off and on and you have uh, the bump still present. Then the chitin remains structurally unchanged. And there's a strong structural correlation that suggests a very dense GBPA network on the chitin. And the difference in slope suggests that GBPA absorbs, adsorbs unevenly, and probably some of regions are more accessible that are, than others. And uh, that makes a lot of sense. So here is what we get uh, if we think of it in biological terms. So we have the, uh, the bacteria that secrete. GBPA, then it's like throwing out anchors and reserving space on chitin. So very rapidly, the chitin surface on zooplankton or whatever it is, is covered with these anchors. So that's how it, we expect that it might look like. And then the bacteria bind to this chitin decorated surface. So why would that make any sense? <clears throat> well, I think um, if it reserves, I mean, it's much quicker to produce a lot of GBPA secreted out and reserve the space for the bacteria on the chitin so that no other bacteria or other things can bind there. And then the bacteria have time to multiply and form microcolonies, and they get even the food supply through the LPMO domain, which degrades chitin, and provides food to these uh, bio, bio, uh, microcolonies in the biofilm. So I, what I would now really like uh, is to observe this really uh, with cryo-ET. That would be fantastic if we would be able to, to do that. And also find the interaction partner on the bacterium, which might be possible with NMR. We haven't come very far on that yet, but a master's student in my lab, Abelone, uh, together with our colleague Perish and Christiansen, they got beautiful NMR spectra. So far, as you can see from the red and blue, there is uh, no binding partner found yet. In principle, we would hope to see differences upon binding. So this is still an ongoing project. But uh, we can already say that um, Abelone got a prize for one of the three best master's uh, thesis on sustainability for her work. And here you see at the ceremony where he got, she got the prize from the rector. And that is all I can and want to tell you today. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. I also would like to acknowledge once more both Henrik and my distinct set of collaborators without this, it would not have been possible to come that far. And in the discussion section, I also hope that you can come up with suggestions to go on with this project. Thank you very much.